announcer, Sammy Davis Jr.'s son, Manny Davis. And the executive director of the Harrison House, Ms. Catherine Duncan. Let us start with you. The Moulin Rouge, as we heard, was the first um, racially integrated resort in Las Vegas. And by all means, it was a national sensation as well. It opened in 1955. Ms. Duncan, can you briefly detail its short-lived but exciting time in Las Vegas? So some of the people here, and thank you, weren't born during this time. So let me set the stage. Nevada sent soldiers to end the Civil War. The Moulin Rouge opened 90 years after the Civil War ended. So the country of France was looking for ways to mend race relations in America. So there was a Moulin Rouge in Paris already that had opened in uh, 1889. And it had great black entertainment there. So France believed that black entertainment in Las Vegas would help bridge that divide. And uh, they thought it would bring the races together. There was a, an attempt to put the Moulin Rouge on Jackson Avenue. But a lawsuit happened and it ended up on Vanessa Road. Now there were, the owners were people like Bisno and Ruben. You've heard of the Ruben sandwich. They teamed up with the heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis, and they opened this fabulous resort on Finance Road. After about four and a half, five months, the sheriff packed locked the doors to standing room only crowds. Uh, the uh, showroom opened that December. Dick Taylor, who was working at the Hacienda Hotel, opened it up at New Year's Eve. It went into bankruptcy shortly after that, and a man by the name of Leo Fry who couldn't get a gaming license um, because he was an alleged diamond smuggler. And uh, <laughs> it eventually went to his son and he gave leases to uh, various uh, operators. He gave a contract for sale to many of the operators, many of them being Dr. Sarah Ann Knight Preddy and the Walker family. They opened it and ran it for about 15 to 20 years as a banquet hall and a nightclub with limited gaming. There it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, so then it brought in interesting investors like Bob Johnson from BET and the um, Pequot tribes. Leo Fry finally sold it to Bart Levy, a Canadian developer. But on the day it was supposed to close escrow, it suffered an arson fire, May 29, 2003. So eventually it was taken down by the government as an unsafe building. So that's the history. <laughs> okay. Why do you think that the Moulin Rouge is so significant to Las Vegas and our history? I know it's very uh, meaningful to you and to many people. The Moulin Rouge is significant, and you, you asked me out of order, so you know I get to. Okay. <laughs> so for me, the Moulin Rouge is significant because it stand or stood as, a, as a, um, a way to integrate America during a time when it was segregated. And the fact that it was closed by the um, establishment because it was just not appropriate for blacks and whites to mingle in public, it just wasn't accepted. Not only was it not in, in Las Vegas, it, it wasn't accepted across America at the time. Now, Anna Bailey was one of the lead dancers <laughs> at the Moulin Rouge's uh, Tropican Can Review. What brought you to Las Vegas? Well, I was working up in Buffalo, New York, and, uh, and Pearl Bailey was on the show, or I was on the show with Pearl Bailey. And um, kids came to the same show because you have to go to Las Vegas. So we was there that we found out that we were getting ready to go to Las Vegas, and we were booked. And we were ecstatic, we were just so excited. And um, about 20 of us girls came out here and there was all the photographers who were waiting for us at the airport. And we were just thrilled. But the only thing that made us a little nervous, we, we thought we were gonna go on the strip. 
And, and as we, we passed by all the lights, it was getting darker and darker, and we went through the underpass. Uh, we were really shocked, but when we saw uh, the Moulin Rouge, it was so beautiful. And, um, and we were just thrilled to be there. Can you describe just the, the look and the feel of Las well, Vegas? Well, I felt like I was in Paris, because mm -hmm. he had the Jim Doms out there with their uniforms on, and, and, um, and, and the dress rooms had, had showers in them, and we had the wardrobe mistresses, and, the, and, and it, was, it, it was just a, it was just beautiful. And just to look out in the, uh, the showroom and to see so many people, it was just jam-packed every single night. And I just don't know, I just can't realize to, 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 to the day how the place closed. I just can't understand it. Tell us about um, opening night at the Moulin oh, Rouge Hotel. Night. What was that? Everybody was there. Everybody, every, almost all of Hollywood was there. Almost all the strip was there. All the showgirls from the strip came over, missed it, missed it part of their show to catch our show. It was a uh, hit from the, uh, just from the beginning because uh, Clarence Robinson was a choreographer and, the, and, and the, our music was just beautiful. The tempo, tempo, tempo was way up like this and, and we were just really ha so happy to be here in Vegas and dancing and just to see all the stars out there. I, like Joe Adams, I don't know if everybody might be too young here, but I had a radio show from coast to coast and to see uh, Joe Lewis sitting on the ringside, and it was it was just a fabulous evening. Mm -hmm. I think we have a photo of someone. <laughs> <laughs> at the Moulin Rouge Hotel in 1955. Manny Davis, it is an honor to have you it's with us tonight. It's nice to be here with everybody on the panel and you uh, and everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> I would like for you just to tell us a little bit about your childhood and what you remember from your time in, in Las Vegas. Okay, well, it's a long story, but I'll make it a little short. Uh, <laughs> I'm adopted to let everyone know, but um, beforehand I was adopted twice. So um, the Davis family had been my third family. Um, my original mother, she had three other children besides me, and she was a teenager when it happened. So she couldn't really take care of all of us at one time, so she gave us a, uh, for adoption uh, to this hairdresser from Queens. Now, uh, it just so happens that um, my, mother, um, my father's third wife, Alfie Davis, my future mother, mm -hmm. and her mother, mm -hmm. Alfie's also. <laughs> Uh, they, um, they were customers of hers. And I didn't know at the time when I was a kid, but she wanted to have children. And Sammy didn't want to so much. He had three other children, but because of the times, you know, during the 50s and 60s, it was really hard for him to put his name out there. So he spent most of his time working and wasn't there um, as a family man like they wanted. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of scared of it, but um, so what my mother did was she just spent more time with me before she, I got a chance to meet um, my future father, and she fell in love with me, and then it was time to introduce me to Sam. And so uh, from the first time he met me, he just fell in love. And then I just started touring with him, not like performing on stage or anything, you know, just in the back and sit down and drink that Roy Rogers. And I'll see the <laughs> you know, so um, it was really cool. I got a chance to, um, I call it like a living wax museum, because I got a chance to see all of the, um, all the greats back in the days before they got into trouble. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> when they were at their, their highest um, peak, you know. And so it was a cool thing to see as a kid, all the people you idolized growing up, you get a chance to meet them courtesy of the man they idolized growing up. And so I had that uh, for a good eight years, back and forth between the coasts. And um, I, I equated it to um, um, Annie, because when I was in a foster home, I wanted to be adopted by Daddy Warbucks. I want to live in a mansion. I don't want to live that hard enough life anymore. And it actually happened in real life. Wow. 
And when the tragic part is, when it became official in 1989, he passed away five months later. And we lost everything he worked so hard for. So it's good to say nowadays, after 30 plus years, I'm now in control of the estate. And we're bringing his legacy back out just like that. Who are some of the people you met while, while traveling? Oh, uh, okay. Well, <laughs> I have a funny Michael Jackson story. Oh. Okay, so uh, let's hear it. Yeah, yeah. So, oh no, not that, that kind of story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so.